The title was suggested uh, as, uh, for, uh, to me as best practices in wool, uh, farming and processing, and uh, I tried to think a bit about what I was going to say, starting by the definition, of course. And this is the outline of my, my presentation. It's going to start with the definition, giving some context, uh, how to utilize the context or how we have been using, utilizing it, why to do it, and some conclusions and final thoughts. So the definition of best practices. Uh, I was just in Wikipedia and searching some uh, definitions and this is what came up as the best um, alternative, the best uh, way to round it up. It's a concept, uh, it's a method, process or technique that has, the generally, that has been generally accepted and therefore standardized as superior to any alternatives based on the fact that it, it accomplishes desired results. So some things to say about this is that the term best is already subjective, so uh, it's now more referred to as preferred, not best, so nothing is better than everything else, it's uh, relative. Uh, generally accepted, again, uh, what is applicable in some context might not be applicable in other contexts, so maybe what is applicable in Argentina might not be applicable in Australia, so this is something to, to bear in mind. Then the idea that it's a method, process or technique implies that you are, uh, this is uh, constantly evolving, so it's an evolutionary concept. And then uh, once these methods, practices are audited, they become certifications and that therefore we're going to base ourselves in the certifications that are today in the market. Traceability just uh, has been talked about and is the first thing we have to talk when uh, addressing preferred practices. The reason for this is because I think it's the, possibly the most important thing uh, to, to, to start with because it brings transparency, this has already been pointed out, so it shows what you are about, gives visibility, which is something arguably possible, uh, positive, but on the other hand, it brings accountability. So you start being accountable for what you're doing and how you're doing it. But also accountability has a positive side again, that is you start to have numbers, figures, and so on. So what this means is that it exposes the core business values of each organization, and this is what is the, the new, uh, or the most important thing of traceability, possibly, that it, it, it shows what you believe in, and this is how you start to relate with clients and end users. This is very important. And when you start showing what you believe and what you are made of, it should bring, as a consequence, higher environmental and social standards. Anyway, in either case, preferred practices aim to improve these uh, social standards and um, environmental standards. And the last thing about traceability is that for a number of reasons it focuses on the primary production more than in the rest of the supply chain. Whenever you see an image, you will see an image of a farm. Uh, you can see images of workers, but always the sheep, you know, and these sort of things. PETA is always uh, very important in, in why probably we're putting the focus on, on primary production. And, and this is what I'm going to be doing today as well. So to start with the context, I will try to be uh, very brief with this because all the production figures have been very nicely put out before me. So I will just go to the things I find interesting about our production. Uh, sorry, first the context is already where I am speaking from, which is uh, being part of the Schneider Group. And we are uh, focusing, the Schneider Group is uh, founded in 1920. Uh, we have four coming plants. Uh, Furman is one of those four. One is in China, one is in Egypt, another one in Italy, and then it's us in, in Treleu, which is where we're going tomorrow. And uh, the whole group has a capacity of uh, 18,500 uh, tons of wool per year of processing and employs 600 uh, people. In Furman, we uh, have got uh, a capacity of 4,500 tons of wool tops per year, which equates to roughly 7.5 million kilograms of greasy wool each year. 
Uh, the average that we come is 20.4 microns, so we are in the fine merino end. Um, and we employ 115 people in our mill. It's located in, in Treleu. This you will see tomorrow, those who are coming. Ten years ago, we started uh, a farm management division. This, uh, today, after 10 years, we are uh, managing 12 farms. Uh, we have a number of between 120 and 150,000 sheep that we run. That makes up 460 tons of greasy wool top per year. Average of our farms is 20 microns. And we do this in 680,000 uh, hectares in Patagonia, employing 58 people. This has given us a unique uh, structure where we are vertically integrated with the primary production and we have a very close uh, input also with the industry and, and the end uh, consumer so we can react to changes and necessities and sort of uh, experiment a bit in our farms and this is what we are doing and what I, want, what I wanted to show today. Context of Argentina, very roughly, this is the uh, product, the livestock of sheep in Argentina since '94 up to date. It's gone uh, down most of the time. I chose to put to the volcanic volcanoes that we suffered. Uh, those blue lines show the volcanic activities that devastated great areas of our country and, of course, impacted the livestock. Fortunately, in the past uh, few years, it's starting to recuperate a bit, uh, uh, possibly thanks to wool prices. And here is the production in kilograms against the Australian wool prices. So just to show that production is fortunately at a, it's a very low level but it's starting to recuperate. So this is. <clears throat> in the country there are six areas uh, of production and uh, Patagonia which is the blue area. Uh, is the largest and where most of the merino wool is produced. So 66% of the Argentine production is located in the blue area, which is Patagonia and where we are based. And that is where we want to focus today. The rest of the country is a bit more into the coarser end. So we will skip it for the purpose. The wool, wool clip of Argentina, 61% of our wool clip is uh, fine merino, which is in our standards finer than 24.5 microns. Then there's a 36% that is fr um, from medium, from 24.5 up to 32.5 microns. And then there's only 2-2.5% two, two which is coarser than that, and that is the far north of the country. So Patagonia, the area we want to focus on. Very nice, of course. Arguably, there is one province that could be left outside. It's the province of La Pampa, up there. But we're going to include it because it's very similar and, it, uh, um, and it's part of the, the production scheme that we include. So in this area, Patagonia, it's a 1.8 million kilometers, square kilometers in size. It's 65% of the Argentine total uh, land, which is uh, 2.8 million square kilometers. In that area, there's 2.3 million people living myself, my brothers, and so on, some of those. <laughs> and it's only 5% of the population, which is 44 million. So we have the fortune of living in a, such a big place where only 5% of the population uses 65% of, of the land. So that makes us 1.3 people per square kilometer. In comparison to Australia, Australia has 3.1. Of course, there are areas in Australia which are similarly dense as, as this, but in general, and, and just to make a point, we are very few. Just to put some interesting figures, uh, Sahara Desert has got 2.9 people, so we're still less. Mongolia has got 1.9 people per square kilometer. Only Greenland has less dense, uh, is less densely, des less densely populated than Patagonia. So in Patagonia we have 7.5 million sheep. So if, if you remember how many people we are, and we have 4.2 sheep per square kilometer, there's four sheep to one uh, person. So 
So we have to be careful with that, you know. It's a bit they can take over any time, but so it's nice. What I'm saying here is that it's of course very low dens density. So this gives us a very extensive production scheme. It's quite unique and that's the feature of Patagonia and Merino production in Argentina. What this means in terms of preferred practices is that we manipulate the sheep only three times a year, which is in shearing, uh, winning and lambing. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that most of the places where uh, sheep uh, production takes place, this does not happen, they manipulate sheep more often for a number of reasons. So this is one of the first characteristics. This uh, gives us a lower risk of uh, contagion between the sheep. So it's argu arguably a better san sanitary status than most places. And it makes it easier for us to adequate to the organic standards, for instance. The weather of Patagonia, dry and cool weather, most of it. So it is less prone to infections. There is uh, very low parasites and there's no fly strike. So fortunately, uh, very lucky of us, we do not have the mule sink problem. We never have it, had it. So uh, this is, has been always a great advantage for us. So how do we utilize this context? For us, what we have uh, seen is that the best context we can, the, the best uh, standards we can employ for primary production are these two, which are GOTS organic and RWS certification. Why? Argentina has got a history of, uh, it's a, basically it's been known always as a, you've been eating meat every day, you know, <laughs> we export meat, we are into primary production, exporting primary production always. Therefore, Argentina has always been very involved with uh, the latest technologies, improvements in primary production. That's why since 1994, SENASA, which is the National Health Authority, has um, done the organic protocol in equivalence with the European Union protocol since 94. Therefore, we have a history of organic production. And we have employed the GOTS uh, certification since uh, 98 or 96, many years ago. And as a, an addition to this, and we, we believed that and we noticed that many clients came over to see the organic production and they saw that the sheep, you know, they were concerned about the shearing and that they were being hurt. And maybe for us that we are with the sheep often and we, we understand how farm works this was not a big concern because we know that it's not really hurting the sheep. Sheep go back to the paddocks, they are taken care of, and they live most of their life probably better than most of us because they are in the wild, alone and, and free. But it was very difficult to get this message across and it was even uh, not worthwhile doing it. It was easier to say, okay, let's do something about it. And what we could do about it was adopt this certification that was uh, came in to audit the animal welfare side, which the GOTS only suggested it. And this was done with the, what, well, only this year. So what we're doing is we are certifying all our production with these two certifications. So into the processing of the wool, very simply put, what we do is these four things, which are maintaining the condition that we have of the primary product, ensuring the traceability and minimizing the impact. This is of course uh, our concern as uh, human beings and to have a social aspect that is also at the highest standards possible. So in a nutshell, what, what we have to consider and what I try to bring across with the preferred practices in the Argentine wool industry is that we're trying to, uh, with, with the certifications I outlined, we have the following outcomes. First, we have a defined toxicological and chemical boundaries. This uh, is done with the GOTS certification in our case, mainly. This, of course, uh, means that the end product will have the minimum uh, traces, and this is very good, especially for, for instance, the eczema campaigns that you were talking about, and. Uh, this is very important from that side because it's, it's a plus. 
whether we want to see it or not, that is, that is a reality. Traceability, we already mentioned it many times, but again, gives you the visibility and accountability that you need. This is important, very important, because uh, we will see why also in, in the next slides. The study of pastures that is uh, done with the GOTS and RWS certification in our farms has proven to be very, very important. Uh, we have real problems with the volcanic activities that I showed you and also with the climatic conditions. There's a lot, there has been a lot of overgrazing in the farms in, in Patagonia. Arguably also the ozone layer is quite above Patagonia and Australia and we have a higher, problem, <coughs> higher uh, infiltration from the sun. So this all combined uh, makes the certification a real problem in Patagonia. And we found that the study of pastures is helping us to solve this problem. So we're very welcome for this. Of course, it also means it the animal loads in our farms are determined by this. This is what determines how many sheep we put, put in each paddock. So we have a you know, logical way of, and a methodology of, of working in this sense. This is also very important because it, it uh, preventing the hunger, it brings sheep to the best corporal status they can, they can achieve. And this means, of course, better productivity. So it's also in the numbers. And then we have with the five freedom enforcement of RWS, which is a complementary certification, it also improves the performance of sheep. Everything that has to do with improving animal welfare really impacts the numbers at the end of the day. We, we know this, we've been measuring it, so well, it's a win-win situation, everybody should do it in, in our opinion. Improves information and reporting, you need the numbers to make informed decisions and to be professional, even in, in a very informal um, or, or slightly unprofessional uh, atmosphere, which was uh, the, the farm production in Argentina, historically. So bringing all these certifications and methods and best practice and preferred practices helps to become more professional in that way. And of course, the social standards. It's all about the people. Those who will be in the farm and in the mill taking care of your product, making sure that uh, the quality is right, making sure that the animals are well treated and when you don't see them, is that they are taken care of. So it's very important that the people behind this are in the, in the best possible situation. And also it's a concern of the industry, so of course. So why do it? To be brief, uh, peace of mind, I mean, I want to work personally in a place where I am comfortable with the values that we have, where we are taking care of the, of the I live in Patagonia, so I want to make sure that I, I can continue go fishing and have good, good assaults with my friends, and, and this is part of it. So taking care of, of, of our environment is very important. But then, of course, I want to make sure there's continu continu continuity in the business and that we are doing something to grow. So this, all this is what the first reason probably why we have, we have to do it. Second, it helps to control your business because it helps you measure, it helps you promote efficiency, and it helps you to create a culture, to have values and to translate those values along your, your business. And this is uh, very important. It gives you visi visibility, traceability, which is the third point, sorry. It gives you visibility, which means that you can differentiate yourself. We live in a world and a business which is, has been a commodity-based business and to be able to see some, to be different in a way, is a great opportunity for some. This combination of, of things is, uh, for what we have seen, is extremely well received by end users. Once you start relating with the values and not just by your uh, measured product uh, parameters, uh, but what your intentions are and what you're doing and how you're trying to improve, this is very well seen and it gives you uh, shared values, client fidelity and the possibility of long-term associations. This is uh, a key point for us. Then fifth point is to step out of your comfort zone. Uh, the day that you're not doing something new, that you're not challenging yourself, that you're not questioning things, you're dying. So. Stay, it's important to move out of that zone and to start to look for new, um, move away from the commodity into the specialty business by doing this. And the sixth point is probably where we should all agree, I think, is that 
If we do this, it would be a nice way or a possible way to increase our portion in the textiles as a whole. We are still 1, 1.2% 1 and we should aim to increase that. This is a random, random fact that I chose to include because when I was doing some research I found out that uh, Argentina is the second largest country in a global surface, so we have 3 million, but check out Australia, it's number one with 22 million. So it's quite uh, interesting that organic production of wool in Australia is virtually none or very, very, I could not find figures really, but it's, I, I, I think it's very small. It's very small. And this is the, the country's uh, organic production in general. So that was something that, I don't know, caught my attention. So conclusions. It's uh, better to serve the market rather than impose on it. Um, it's very good that we're doing a lot of things to, in the long term, prove that uh, wool is great. We all know this. You know, wool is the best fiber, no doubt about it. But now we're doing things to prove this, which is brilliant and great. But maybe we're a bit behind already on this, so it's also good to do something that the market is asking and try to serve it. In our case, RWS is an example. Mulesing might be the example, maybe, of, and I'm talking from a position where, if from Argentina, we don't have this problem, so it's, it's very difficult to be judgmental about it. But maybe this was a slower, uh, we were a bit slow to react as an industry, or it was something that well, in, in any case, what I'm trying to say is that we have to try and address these issues as soon as we can and have answers. Even if, if in the long game we have another uh, strategy, it's good to have a short-term strategy as well. The second conclusion is that uh, best practices or preferred practices is it's a journey, it's not a destination, so we have to all be in the same uh, boat. So to go fast, go alone, and to go far, go together. This is a very cheesy unknown but I just wanted to put it there. And today we have a proliferation of standards, right? So what is the right standard? I am saying today here that RWS and organic is the best standard, right? Maybe it's a, a regenerative, uh, or maybe it's animal wildlife, who knows? I mean, we should know this. We should have a common agree on this. And we don't have it today, and this is a major issue. There's a lot of misleading information as well. Some standards are, you know, they called uh, um, good animal, good sheep, and, and, and why? And this is creating confusion as well. So it's important that we make some common ground and build on this. If not, we are just, you know, not functioning well as a whole, or not optimizing our, our capacities. And there's our last uh, point. Is all wool organic? Well, some people say, of course, all wool is organic. I think all wool is organic. Why not? It's the best fiber, and it's, it's really, you know, really organic. But anyway, on the other hand, we said, well, there is an organic protocol, let's do it. Let's do better than what is already the best fiber. Let's improve it. And we did it. Those who, those who didn't do it are still selling a commodity. So this is important. And that's what I'm saying with the no, basically. We, we moved away from the comfort zone and we started having a speciality. So, and, and, and just not to say it as a, as a random word, what happens with Argentine wool in history is that it's been always sold maybe one dollar below Australian prices. Historically, that's the case. And with organic wool, we are selling over Australian prices in many cases. So that is the bottom line in numbers. Final thoughts? Well, we have opportunities today there's new markets uh, and new technologies. Are we doing enough uh, to, to tackle this, to, to confront this, to give them answers? Are we working there? Today, organic wool, for instance, is small in, in proportion. And where I'm talking to, I'm, I'm, we are a small producer of wool, maybe, in the world. But we have an opportunity. We saw this opportunity. And it would be good that the industry as a whole could, could use this opportunity. And this is a trend that is really growing a lot. So we should look into this in a different way, possibly. And it's, a, it's an interesting market because it has exponential growth and better margins. That This, in my opinion, is one of the explanations why the wool prices today are in the levels that they are. It's because of this new market. So we need to change the mindset, best practices. Every 
implementation of a best or preferred practice we have done has always outweighed the costs and the hassles of doing it. We've proved it with numbers, with the animals, with the industry, its efficiency, you gain, it's a win-win situation. So it's a no-brainer. Speciality business, and to close, and to make the point again, the more we serve the market, listen to it, and stay in the journey of preferred practices, the closer we will be as an industry to break the commodity status and enter the speciality one. So, thank you very much.